you know, one of the things that's interesting um, is that another kingdom is full of references to the Bible and to notions of community and neighborliness in bi biblical times. So can you say a little bit more about um, about sort of the role of religion and or, you know, these parables that you're sharing as part of, you know, your your outlining of a new paradigm. Yeah. Well, I the way I understand it, it has it's a matter of competing meta narratives, and uh, uh, it's it's over simple to say that the, the great competition is between the the narrative of uh, that the market is all containing uh, and a narrative of human covenantalness. Uh, covenantedness that has its rootage in the biblical tradition. Uh, so uh, I, th I think it's not a matter of, uh, of religion being uh, a distinct sphere. It is a question whether uh, uh, a uh, trustworthy religious tradition can generate uh, a meta narrative uh, that can be uh, compelling and empowering uh, as distinct from the dominant narrative that largely remains uncritical mm. among us. Uh, and so mm. I do not want my religious tradition or my own work uh, to be slotted in the, the sphere of uh, religion. I think that's a, a misreading of the biblical tradition. And uh, my own uh, vocation uh, is to try to uh, help people uh, get over the misreading of the Bible that I think has largely been captured by the meta narrative of the market. Ah, ah. So again, you're sort of help bringing us and encouraging us to view um, a lot of this framing from a much broader place um, to really encourage us all to question the dominant culture. And and if if I can ask, you know, your book really does do a good job of outlining the four pillars of the free market ideology and then very intentionally proposing an alternate paradigm. It's really based on the neighborly covenant and I love the language I have to say. Can you tell us a bit more about the framing of the free market for those of us who may not have read the book yet and then, um, then also contrast it by some of the elements that you've highlighted in the neighborly covenant and how we would create a culture of neighborliness. Well, I, I think that the, uh, the, uh, the principal claim of market ideology is that life consists in the accumulation of commodities. Uh, so it's uh, propelled by uh, consumerism and it's sustained uh, by uh, militarism and by uh, the assumption that there are technological solutions to every problem. Uh, and what that does, in sum, it, uh, as, as we are witnessing every day, it excludes people uh, from social participation who do not have uh, wealth and technical competence. And uh, mm -hmm. you can't build a neighborhood that way. Uh, so I think that the, the uh, biblical tradition, uh, alongside some other traditions, uh, really believes that face-to-face -face relationships uh, that are grounded in trust and that are practiced in generosity uh, and fidelity uh, constitute a wholesale uh, contradiction uh, uh, to market ideology because in market ideology there can be no neighbors. Uh, everyone uh, is a threat or a rival or a competitor. Uh, and. Mm. Uh, so, so what an alternative narrative needs to do is to recharacterize the people that are in front of us as neighbors, and then that that evokes a whole different set of practices that are not possible as long as the people in front of us are not neighbors but are rivals. So, Christy, sir, let me just respond quickly if they haven't read the book. Is the mm -hmm. free market consumer ideology, first of all, believes in scarcity, that there's not enough. It believes that development is good. It considers uh, if you don't develop a piece of property, it, you've rendered that property useless. So the land now is useless unless we've built upon it. 
It also believes in certainty and perfection. Uh, we privatized everything. We, see, we think that the common good, so what Walter and John have represented forever, is a return to the commons and the common good. And, uh, and, and when I asked uh, Walter uh, what the Jews found in the wilderness, and he said neighborliness. And so you know, in a sense, the exodus is from consumption to treating each other as neighbors. And see, in the consumer world, we have to label each other. We need to categorize each other in order to know how to serve and sell each other. And uh, so in my mind, there's no such thing as a homeless person. There are people who don't know where they're sleeping at night. But as soon as you mm -hmm. call somebody homeless, you have a very narrow uh, market version of who that person is. 